Good morning, church. Good to be with you and have this opportunity to share uh, the next installment on Game Changing Prayers. I really like that title when Pastor Adrian uh, Cottrell suggested it to me for the series. Um, I, I don't know much about sport. I thought the World Cup was a horse race. And uh, uh, this is the first year, believe it or not, this is the first year I've ever been involved in an AFL footy tipping competition. I've avoided it until now. And I got, uh, I got uh, managed to get raked into one this year. And, uh, and guess who was on top until yesterday? I was on top of the ladder. Thank you very much, Port Power. Uh, I don't know when uh, Fremantle started winning games, but there you go. Um, so I don't know much about sport, but I like the idea that there are prayers and there is a way of praying that, uh, that change things up so that we go from being on the back foot to moving forward and taking ground in prayer. And so that's what this series is about. And that's what we're talking about. Pastor Bill spoke the first week from the Ephesians 1 prayer about seeking God. Uh, Pastor Tim shared last week on wisdom. And, uh, and this week, we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer. When we were looking at who should um, share this message, Pastor Tim said to me, Nathan, I think you should do the Lord's Prayer. If you can't preach on the Lord's Prayer, you should have your pastor's credential taken away from you. He actually said that. He, he claims he was joking. I think pastors that pour water over themselves in slow motion should have their pastor's credential taken away from them. So the Lord's Prayer. And, uh, and this is one that, you know, quite often I hear younger Christians, but not necessarily. A lot of people say, well, I don't know how to pray. How should I pray? What should I pray? Well, there is a prayer that we can always have ready on our lips. And, uh, and I learned this the hard way, actually. I was in a prayer meeting a few years ago with a group of leaders from, from uh, different churches in our area, and they have a regular uh, prayer breakfast. And, uh, and this was the first time I'd, I'd been to one of these, and it got to the end of the meeting, and one of the gentlemen there, an older gentleman, turned to me and said, well, Nathan, to, to close the meeting, why don't you lead us in the Lord's Prayer? And uh, now, I had a couple of options at that point in time. I could have gone, I've lost my voice. Right? That's a perfectly valid uh, option. I could have said, you know, I'm a little, I, I know the Lord's Prayer, but perhaps maybe a little bit rusty on it. Maybe you, you should lead us. Instead, I just heard the word sure come out of my mouth. And so I thought, okay, come on. I've been a Christian a long time. I should know the Lord's Prayer. This will be fine, right? And, uh, and so I started off. Now, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And by that point, I'm getting a little bit confident then because I'm like, this is going really well. So give us this day, our daily bread. I was t confident, taking ground. And lead us not into temptation. Whoops. I had missed out an entire line. And everybody else on the table knew this prayer. They'd been to the prayer meeting several times. And apparently that was how they always closed the prayer meeting. And so that they just kept going in spite of my mistake. And I learned two very important things. One, don't embarrass yourself in front of the other Christian leaders. That was rather awkward. And uh, the second thing was there is a prayer we can always have on our lips ready. And there is a lot of gold in this prayer. And we're going to unpack it uh, this morning. There's two versions of the Lord's Prayer in the Scriptures. There's one in Matthew, one in Luke. And they're not different uh, tellings of the same event. Um, it's very reasonable to think that Jesus shared and taught on the Lord's Prayer on many occasions. And so we're going to use the Matthew 6 version today. The version in Luke, some of the petitions, some of the lines are a little bit shorter. And one, the last line is actually left out altogether. So we're going to focus on the Matthew version, which was when Jesus was... Uh, uh, teaching the, the Sermon on the Mount. The version in Luke is when he was just with his disciples and they came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. So this Matthew version uh, was Jesus was teaching on prayer and he said, this is how you pray. And so I want to say that to you this morning. When you don't have something to pray, this is what you pray. Now, interestingly enough, there is one part of the prayer that quite often gets prayed, which I'm not going to talk about this morning. And that is, there's a little bit on the end that people love to pray for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen which is great and uh, there's nothing technically wrong with it although it doesn't actually appear in the scriptures 
And so what most scholars are agreeing it with now is that that was probably a, some sort of devotional edition that was put into the scriptures in the second or third century. And most modern translations does not have that line on the bottom. There's nothing wrong with closing a prayer in that. And at the end of our service today, we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together and we're going to finish with that. But I'm just not going to talk about uh, that this morning. What we are going to talk about is what is called the seven petitions of the Lord's Prayer. Seven uh, prayers, seven things you can pray over yourself and over others. And it's what Jesus taught us to pray. So we're going to focus on all seven. Um, although uh, I'm probably going to hone in on a couple and spend a bit more time on those uh, this morning. But uh, I'm trusting that as I share these things this morning, that your faith will be stirred, that you will see something fresh about prayer and about your prayer life this morning. Um, one of our ladies at our 8.30 service came to me after the service and said, Nathan, as you were just sharing about that, I, really, I got a, a vision of a key in a lock. And she said, it was like God was showing me that the Lord's Prayer is like a key in the lock, that when we turn it, when it opens it up, uh, that, that God reveals himself and he helps us to understand and he enlightens. And I like that imagery, that this is something that you can pray that will unlock where there is lack of understanding. Um, and so God brings that. All right, so let's have a look at the, uh, the first part here. And um, you can hold those on screen while I'm talking on about them. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is just the, the introduction, the first line, our Father in heaven. Uh, when you're praying, it's good to address who you're praying to. That sounds like it's pretty obvious, but um, I remember Barry Chant t uh, preaching years ago and saying this, and I've observed it since myself. Sometimes people don't know who they're praying to. They mention the Father, Son, and the Spirit all in one sentence, and it's a bit all over the place. And it's good to be conscious that when we are praying, we are praying to our, our Heavenly Father. Jesus died on the cross so that we could have relationship with Him and, and have direct access to praying to the Father. So it's good to address our prayers. There might be reasons why sometimes you would pray directly to Jesus, who understands all the trials and tribulations that we face. It's good to pray to Jesus. Or, or you might pray, Holy Spirit, give me insight, give me wisdom in this situation. So it's a simple little thing, but it's good to know who you're addressing your, your prayers to. All right, well, then the first petition is the next line there. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed. It's not a, a very common word that we would use in our everyday English these days, but it's really a petition of worship. It's about starting your prayers off with worship, recognizing that God, his very name and his nature is perfect, he's holy. He's righteous. And so this is a petition of worship. Sometimes what happens in prayer is that we come to God and we, we want to offload our hearts straight away. God, I've got this thing wrong and that thing wrong and this is weighing me down and Lord, I, I need help in this and, and that. Now, there's nothing wrong uh, with, with praying for needs. And we're going to talk a bit about that. But when we start with worship... It realigns us to God's will. It actually gives us a different perspective. And so it's really, really important. It's one of the reasons why we start our, our services with worship when we come together. We don't just jump into teaching the word and unpacking things or, or praying and asking for things. I love those songs that we sang this morning. In God we trust. God will not be shaken, no matter what the circumstance or situation is. God, you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's his very nature. And so I, it's good just to spend some time in worship. And I want to encourage you in your prayer times. If you are reflecting right now and thinking, you know what? I don't, I don't have that element in my, my, my prayer times, in my devotional life. I want to encourage you. Start by worshiping. It might be putting a song on, listening to a worship song, or just praying a psalm of thanks. But start with worship. It realigns. It gives you a different perspective. And that habit will, will change up your prayer life. And it's very important for what comes next. Let's have a look at the, the next slide. Because the second and third petitions are about how God gives us insight and intervention. How God, you, you probably heard the term divine intervention on some occasions. Uh, God really does give insight and intervention. 
I'm going to take these two together because they're quite closely related. First of all, your kingdom come. Well, what does that mean? When we pray that, how does that change up our prayer life? It's not going to come as a surprise to many of you when I say that we live in an imperfect world. There is lots of things wrong in our world. There are lots of things that are confusing and things we don't understand. As you know, we're in the grips of uh, election fever at the moment. And I hear a lot of people going, well, okay, I don't know who I'm going to vote for. It's, it's all a bit uh, confusing and, and discouraging. America, of course, they're in the, the throes of a, an election as well and in uh, and, and a similar situation. A couple of weeks ago, there was a group of us went to a morning tea from here. Some of our leaders and staff went to a morning tea. And the, the key speaker for that was our former Prime Minister, Mr. John Howard. And it was a real honour and privilege to be able just to shake his hand and say, thank you for your, your legacy and your leadership, for what you did in our country. And, uh, and he was asked, you know, what, what, what are you most proud of for your time as Prime Minister? And there's a few things, but uh, the thing he's most proud of was the reform on gun law, on gun control law. And, uh, and as he was talking about that at this, this morning tea, you could see around the room it was palpable. People were nodding their heads and going, yes, thank you, Mr. Howard. And it really brought it home this week as we saw what happened in Orlando. 50 people in the LGBT community who uh, have just had their lives taken from one man. And we don't really know what his motive was. Maybe it was idealistic. Maybe it had terrorist connections. Maybe he was struggling in his own sexuality. We don't really know. But for whatever reason, it was certainly a hate crime that he was so full of anger and bitterness and hatred that he would lash out and take the lives of 50 people before then taking his own life. And you see the pain and the, just the grief that the families and friends go through and the anger that's stirred up in the global community. And then just a few days ago in England, British MP Joe Cox, they're coming up to a vote this week on whether Britain should leave the European Union. She's just talking about what she believes, a young mum, two little kids. And again, just an angry man lashes out, violently attacks and, and kills this lady. And that's just in the last week. There are circumstances, there are things going on in our world all the time that if we look at it and, and we can feel sometimes a sense of hopelessness and ask, well, God, what, what are you doing here? What, what's going on? I want to say to you that even in times when we can't fully understand why, God is in control. That when we pray something like, Lord, your kingdom come. It acknowledges that there is a reign, there is a rule, there is a power and authority above our own, above politicians, above the, any who would seek to take control in our world. And we need to, to rest assured in that. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, it's a spiritual kingdom. And I wonder how often we actually pray, Lord, we need a little bit of your heaven to come down to earth. We need some understanding in this situation. Lord, we need your light to be seen because it's not God's will that evil acts should be done like that. But God can be glorified through it. I was so encouraged to hear that there's a church there, a Pentecostal church in Orlando, that their immediate response was, we're offering free funerals to the families Whoever wants them, we just want to bless those families. That's a positive way of responding out of a tragic circumstance. And then you see that next little bit, your will be done. It's about putting will to one side, our will to one side, and saying, God, your will be done. Show me what your will is. Let it be on earth here, just like it is in heaven. That's a difficult thing to do. When I was in high school... Um, I remember we had a guest speaker come, and he was an old priest, had like the full garb on and everything, and um, and I was in a very secular uh, school. I could have counted on one hand the number of people who said, yes, I'm a Christian and I go to church. And so, uh, so I kind of wondered how this was all going to go down. 
and uh, and he was an older man. He was a little bit grumpy and dour, and uh, so he he starts speaking. And there's a girl in the front row who's just chatting away to her friend. She wasn't interested in hearing what he had to say. And he looked at her and just paused and waited. And she suddenly became aware that somebody was staring at her. And she looked up and, and he said, are you finished? And she said, yes. And he said, good, shut up. What a rude thing to say to somebody that you don't know. And I thought, he's just lost the respect of everybody in the room. Nobody's listening. Well, believe it or not, it had the opposite effect. Nobody else wanted to be told to shut up, I assume, so uh, they, they were all listening very carefully now. Well, he started to talk about the Lord's Prayer. In fact, this line in particular, he said, when you pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, and Lord, I really, really mean that. I'm not just going through the motions. He goes, it's been my experience. When you pray, your will be done. He goes, you start to see the hand of God at work. And he then shared testimony after testimony of times that he's prayed this and he'd seen it, the hand of God at work. And as we were, were leaving and we're moving out, and I, I turned to a classmate of mine and I said, I said, wow, I think he really lost everyone when he told that girl to, to shut up. And, and this guy, who was not a Christian, as far as I know, turned to me and he says, oh, no, nah, you, you've got to respect him. Like he's really clearly, he's, he believes what he's talking about. He practices it. And I was like, whoa, okay. And it was interesting. As people were filing out, they were talking about this going, wow, okay. What do you think? What do you reckon? In a way that I had not seen my, my schoolmates do before. And that's never left me. Let your will be done. And Lord, I really, really mean that. I put my own will to one side. I want to see your will done. Lord, what is your will in this situation? Jesus practiced this. Jesus practiced all these elements of the Lord's Prayer, by the way. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was, was knelt down there and tears streaming from his eyes, he said, Lord, if there's any other way, take this cup away from me. Yet not my will be done, but your will. We can see how Jesus prayed that in a, in a situation. And you know, God's will was done on that day when Jesus went to the cross, when he rose again. And in what seemed like a hopeless situation, and his will is still being done today. How we need to rest assured in that. Some of you here today are facing situations where, that you feel hopeless in. Maybe it's with family members, friends, in the workplace. Let me encourage you, start to pray this over your life, over the life of others in your family, in your circle of influence, and you will start to see the hand of God move. Don't pray out of despair and hopelessness, but have the faith that miracles will rise from the ashes of evil acts that are committed, or where you see godlessness. Pray, God, show yourself, glorify yourself in this. So we worship God in prayer. God gives us insight and, and intervention when we need it. And then the next petition is about provision. God provides. I want to spend a bit of time on this one. Give us today our daily bread. I don't think it's just about bread, really, because, um, you know, if, if that was the case, and most of us have the resources here to be able to just go to a shop and buy bread if we needed bread on a daily basis. So I don't think it's talking just about bread. This is normally our starting point in prayer, the give me prayers, or the Lord, I need this, Lord, help me with this. Now, there is nothing wrong with praying for needs, but there's a reason why we pray those other things beforehand, why we worship him, why we acknowledge his authority, why we say, Lord, let your will be done, because it puts things into perspective, and all of a sudden, the things that we thought we needed, perhaps we actually don't need that much. And we all have needs. It's okay to pray for them, and God does provide. Next week, we're taking up an offering here in our services. Most of you know the story of when we built this facility. God provided miraculously in that situation. He did it again when we extended the building, and again when we built the shed. And I know that God next week will again provide miraculously for the need that we have. There's some wonderful examples of Jesus literally, or, or God literally, giving bread uh, to people in need. I think of the story in Exodus 16 where God sends manna from heaven on a daily basis that the Israelites needed. Or, or when Jesus was feeding the 4,000, the 5,000, 
Uh, there's all these people there. We're going to feed them. Okay, what have we got? A couple of loaves of bread and a bit of fish. All right, and he blesses the bread, breaks it. They start passing it around, and somehow the need is met. So those, those are literal examples, but it's not just talking about bread or even just food or even just our material needs. What did Jesus say to the devil when he was led into the, the desert and tempted for 40 days? He said, man does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. I discovered something quite interesting about this passage when I was uh, reading on it, and um, I've been living in this for the last uh, month or, or so. If you have a look on the next screen now, the word daily in that sentence, give us today our daily bread. Now, in the original Greek, it's that word there, and I'm probably going to get it wrong. My fellow Greeks can help me out. Uh, in the original Greek, it's the word epousios. Is that right, Lee? Do you reckon I got it right? Close enough. Yeah, where's your Greek senior pastor when you need him? Okay, so apusios. We don't. That's the only time that word appears in Greek literature, either in the Bible or uh, as far as we know. In the third or fourth century, that word, uh, that whole thing is translated into the Vulgate or what they call the Latin, and it's that word there, super substantialum. Sounds like something from Harry Potter or something, doesn't it? Super substantialum. You can straight away see some key English words in there. Super, substance, substantial. God provides everything, substantially provides everything that we need on a daily basis. That is what that full uh, sentence means when you pray that. And so that means, yes, when you're praying for, for food provision or, or, or bills or, or rent or whatever it is, or over your finances, if you're praying over, for example, I trust you're praying over what you're going to uh, put into the offering next week and your commitment to the offering, you can pray about that and say, God, thank you that you provide everything. Um, you can bring that before God in prayer. But more than that, it's spiritual as well. Something I pray every morning before I even start reading the Word. The first thing I pray is, God, reveal yourself to me in the Word today. I know you have something for me, fresh in your Word. Show me you through the Word today. And, I, and trust and believe that God will do that. Praying for spiritual gifts, insight, wisdom, like Pastor Tim talked about last week. You can pray for all of those things. Let me ask you. What is it that God has for you today? Do you believe that God has something fresh for you every day? Because he does. Sometimes we can, we can say that, but not fully live in that, not expect it. I encourage you to, to lift your faith expectancy, to seek him on a daily basis. That changes up your prayer life when you pray like that. The last three petitions the 5th, 6th, and 7th petitions, I'm going to take them together because they're all about our sin. And it's interesting, this is the part of the prayer that Jesus didn't need to pray. Jesus was perfect. And so uh, he didn't need to pray for forgiveness or redemption. He was already aligned to the Father. But he does this so that it's modeled for us, so that we have an appreciation and understanding of it. The first line there, forgive us our debts. Lord, forgive our sins. Forgive the sins that we've committed. The times, and, and, and you're not praying that necessarily, not, not sins that you've committed against others, but our greatest sin is when we are separated from God, when we commit them against God. God, forgive us. And the next one there, we also, are, as we also have forgiven our debtors. When you extend forgiveness to others, it helps you to un fully understand forgiveness in your own life. If we pray, oh Lord, forgive me, forgive me, but we hold bitterness and bad attitudes towards other people, we can't fully appreciate the work of forgiveness in our life. And so the measure that we forgive others with is then also applied to us. That's exactly what that's talking about here. What did Jesus say when he was hanging on the cross? He's been brutalized, he's been murdered. 
He had every reason in the world to be angry or frustrated or whatever. There he is, hanging on the cross, and what does he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What amazing grace. I wonder if any of us could be able to extend such grace and mercy in that kind of situation. Forgiveness. Temptation. Lead us not into temptation. Temptation's a reality. We all face temptations. And it's not saying, God, take temptations out of our life. But it does say, Lord, when I'm coming across temptations, lead me in a different direction. Show me a different path. Help me to follow you. Deliver us from evil. Not allowing evil to take hold in our life, but setting our feet on a higher ground, on the rock that's Jesus. Setting ourselves apart from evil. How do you pray against these things in, in more detail? Well, I was encouraged when I read Psalm 51 a few days ago in our Life Journal readings, which is David's prayer of repentance, really, King David's prayer of repentance. And uh, we're going to have a look at some of it here. The whole psalm is excellent for, for, as a psalm of repentance. But if we have a look at the, um, the next screen there, Psalm 51 from verse 10. And it says, Create in me, Lord, a pure heart. Oh, God, renew a steadfast spirit within me. This is what a repentant spirit looks like. Don't cast me away from your presence, Lord, or take your spirit from me. Restore to me the full joy of salvation. God, that that would be restored. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. You don't delight in sacrifice or I'd bring it. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. You know what? When we go through the motions, God doesn't really care so much about that. So, yeah, okay, you turn up to church. Yes, Lord, I pray, please forgive me. But if you don't mean that in your heart, then it's of no worth to God. My sacrifice, oh God, is a broken spirit. When we acknowledge that we're broken, that there's something broken, fundamentally broken about all of us because we're all born into sin that we have fault that we have sin in our life then we can come before God and say Lord I need you as my sufficiency a broken and contrite heart one that's obedient to God Lord those things you will never despise see it's all about aligning our will to God's that's what this whole prayer is about So the last month, I've been praying this every day. And uh, knowing that I was going to be speaking on it. But it was interesting that I I didn't just sort of sit there and and recite it, Our Father in Heaven. I paused on each petition. And quite often, I, I would get stuck on the second or third. Or today, I started praying it. I got stuck on the first petition, just worshiping God. Acknowledging him. You know, just bringing it back to that thought that sometimes we don't know what to pray. What do I pray? I don't know how how to pray. When you have this prayer on your lips, you will never be short of things to pray when you fully understand each of those petitions. And it's good to learn it off by heart so that you've always got something to pray. Other thing too is, is, and I've mentioned it a couple of times, you can pray this not just over yourself but over others. You notice how many times the word us appears? Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Prayer isn't a show that we put on for other people. It's not about begging or babbling. God knows everything that you need before you ask. Prayer is about aligning ourselves to God's will. And I love what Jesus said just a a few verses later in Matthew chapter 6. He was still sharing the, the Sermon on the Mount. And he made these comments about worry. But they succinctly summarize what he taught on the Lord's Prayer. He says, don't worry. Don't say, what should we eat? What should we drink? What should we wear? He goes, the pagans run after those things. People who are separated from God, who don't know God, they run after those things. And your heavenly Father knows what you need even before you ask for them. What does it say? 
but seek first his kingdom. Put his kingdom first. Reflect on God's kingdom. What does God desire? And his righteousness, his way of doing things, his order. And what does it say? And all these things, all these other things will be given to you. Everything else falls into place. We get the perspective. We get the understanding. Today, let me ask you, are you aligned to God's way of praying? What does God have for you today? Don't live in fear, but make prayer a daily habit of just constantly realigning, realigning to God's will, and you will see the game change. If you don't know what to pray, this is what you pray.